Hi, I'm Michael Fossil. I'd like to thank you for joining me. Um, <clears throat> this is a remark from a poet, uh, well known on this planet, Li Bai, some 1200 years ago, but still prescient and ironic today. As he said, we, if you only hunt for rabbits, you don't get the tigers and dragons. <clears throat> and when it comes to longevity and aging, we tend to go after the rabbits. That is, we go after things like resveratrol and NAD and other things that are small molecular approaches to what are fundamental uh, molecular problems. So I'd like to take us down a slightly different road and look at aging from a broader perspective. And I'd really like to talk about the prospects for being able to cure and prevent age-related diseases by fundamentally intervening in the aging process at the genetic, epigenetic, and, and cellular levels. Well, to do that, let me use an analogy here. This is a quote from Einstein. Any fool can know, the point is to understand. That's often been true historically. For example, Copernicus versus the Vatican astronomers 500 years ago, the Vatican astronomers knew a great deal, had enormous uh, amounts of data on planetary positions, but no understanding of orbital mechanics. And it's a problem that we tend to make sometimes as well. When it comes to aging, we know a great deal, for example, about the physiology and the chemistry and the molecular biology of aging, but we sometimes fail to understand the fundamental processes. So this is something that has intrigued me and, and concerned me for almost 50 years now, since I started here back at Stanford years ago. Uh, and I got intrigued by the aging process. Most people think they understand it. They tend to think it's just wear and tear entropy without giving it a second thought. And that usually means we're not thinking deeply enough. So the question that I wanted to ask myself is, can we alter aging at the most fundamental level? And that really depends on our ability to understand it. This is a point I made 25 years ago here at the NIH of Bethesda in the United States. Uh, first talk ever given on the possibility for reversing human aging at the NIH. And the point I was making was that if we can truly understand aging, again, the most fundamental level, there's potential for being able to intervene effectively in age-related clinical disease. Well, this is something that I published the first book on, and as some of you know, also the first medical literature articles on the prospects for reversing aging and curing age-related diseases in Journal of American Medical Association more than 20 years ago, as well as the first and only textbook on this with Oxford Press and a more recent book for the general public that is uh, sold worldwide and has received quite some acclaim. But if we look at this as a broader perspective, what you find is our ability to affect longevity has largely been restricted to our ability to alter the mean human lifespan. So over the past, say, two centuries, we've gone from a mean human lifespan at the best of times of about a quarter of a century to half a century to now currently about three quarters of a century with no implication at all for the maximum mean lifespan estimated at perhaps 120 years. <clears throat> so we have improved lives enormously without affecting aging in any way. And in fact, if you look back historically, you find that the major medical advance we've ever made has been a conceptual one. It is understanding the possibility that invisible organisms, microbes, can affect human health and cause death and disease. And the, the advent of that understanding allowed us to do things like washing hands of sterile surgery, the earliest vaccines, uh, uh, the earliest antibiotics. Uh, but it's also not only improved lives and lengthened lives, but it's actually lowered the cost of medical care. Example, if you look back about 1950, there were estimates that the world would be medically bankrupt by the year 2000 because of the enormous cost of treating polio victims. But by the year 2000, the WHO figures showed that treating polio or preventing it was less than 10 cents per patient. Now, the same sort of problem is going on now when we look at age-related diseases. We tend to assume that what we need are more technical advances, small molecular advances, but without any true understanding of the aging process. And I would like to suggest we're about to undergo the second major medical revolution in all of human history on this planet, which is the understanding of the aging process, which will allow us not only to cure and prevent age-related diseases, but in so doing actually lower the cost of medical care globally, nationally, and personally. And I'll tell you more about why I think that. Well, <clears throat> I'm gonna restrict much of this talk, not all of it, <clears throat> to examples of the central nervous system that is the brain, because it's something that I've been working on more recently. <clears throat> um, and there are two common statements that are made with regard to age-related diseases in the central nervous system, particularly Alzheimer's. One was this one by researchers, everything works in mice, but nothing works in humans, <clears throat> which is roughly true. Uh, although it neglects the fact that most things don't work in mice and a number of other animals as well. In fact, dozens of other species. Uh, and investors have said Alzheimer's is the graveyard of companies. And again, I'll show you why in a minute, but it's roughly accurate. Well, 
This statement that everything works in mice, nothing works in humans, or in dogs, cats, monkeys, lemurs, squirrel monkeys, baboons, and even chimpanzees, <clears throat> um, nothing works in humans, uh, is roughly true. Animal studies have been tantalizing, but the human trials have resulted in an empty bottle. And I suggest that the reason for this is that we have been digging in the wrong place. And when you're digging in the wrong place, whether it's beta amyloid, tau tangles, or other limited models, digging deeper doesn't help. And it doesn't matter how big the excavator is or how large your NIH budget is. Again, if you are going after the wrong target, you will tend to fail. Well, the result of this was that about three years ago, the Alzheimer's Association and I organized a conference in Washington on animal models of age-related neurodegenerative diseases. In fact, we published it, the, the article shown here on top. And I was summing up the reason why we tended to fail. And I suggested the reason was not that we needed more money or, or, or smarter people and more training, but that we needed a better model. And that the model should encompass everything. It should be a unified model that could look at upstream risk factors and affect and explain why they cause neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Downstream biomarkers, for example, beta amyloid tau tangles, and explain why they occur. Intraspecies heterogeneity that explain why do some people get Alzheimer's early, some late, and some with different clinical presentations. Some get Parkinson's, some get frontal temporal dementia. Why does variety in the patients? Interspecies heterogeneity. <clears throat> why is it that mice have a slightly different physiology, for example, with regard to beta amyloid, <clears throat> um, and as other species do, but they all tend to show cognitive decline or behavioral decline with age. Why do they do it in different ways? Specifically, why do the genes cause this? Also, it should be consistent with all the known clinical research data, and it should offer predictive validity for the FDA trials, for example, the Eli Lilly solanizumab trials or the Biogen and Akinumab trials. <clears throat> Likewise, optimally, it should offer a feasible and, and novel point of intervention to see if we could get out of this morass of failure. Well, the outcome of that was that I was invited to write up my model, which I published last year at the invitation of the editor-in-chief of Alzheimer's Dementia, and it promptly received more than 600 reprint requests globally, clearly striking their chord. But the question I was trying to ask really was this one. When it comes to age-related degenerative diseases, why can't we cure them? Why do we tend to fail? And to give you an idea of what I mean by failure, this was taken in, on uh, September 1st from clinicaltrials.gov, and this is a list of all the interventional trials in the registry. And as you see, more than 3,000 for dementia generically, more than 2,000 for Alzheimer's disease, and almost 2,300 for Parkinson's. And yet, by clinical, uh, by global consensus, those trials, and again, anacanabab notwithstanding, have failed to achieve the outcome. What I mean by that is this. These are the current monoclonal antibody trials, for example. A number of these have been felt to be failures, although some of them are now coming back and being tried again. One, anacanabab, was cleared by the FDA last month, and there are a number of others in the pipeline, and this is by no means a, a comprehensive list. But even when you look at the best of these, the FDA having cleared anacanumab, this is what the anacanumab data looks like at different treatment levels. Um, it's not clear why some of these, these data points wander, but what you find is in all cases, although there's this temporal step off, the final outcome, the clinical course, tends to parallel the placebos, which is disappointing. What we'd like to do is not slightly postpone your stay in the nursing home, but do this sort of thing, where we not only stabilize the disease, but optimally actually improve your cognitive ability, that is essentially cure some of these dementias. So when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, we're left with the same problem that we've seen elsewhere, for example, with regard to the Copernicus and the Vatican astronomers, which is we know a great deal, but we don't understand them. And that's true when we look at all of these things to the right, we know a great deal about these and other features of age-related dementias, but we don't tend to understand what's really going on at the fundamental level. <clears throat> so as I say, what we needed was a unified and, and a systems model. To give you an idea of what we meant by that, let me talk a little bit about them and clear them up. By unified model, as I said, what we need to do is be able to explain why all of these upstream processes, for example, ApoE4 wheels, or exposure to toxins like paraquatic dioxin, or a closed head injury, that is traumatic brain injury, uh, or some of the vascular factors like hypertension and hyperglycemia, why these things uh, or microbial disease all tend to increase your risk for age-related dementias like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And downstream, why do we tend to get beta amyloid plaque in some of these dementias and less than others, tau tangles in some and less than others, and so on. Why do we see all of these changes downstream, these biomarkers? What is going on at the fundamental level between those? How do we translate from one to the other? We also need to do this clinically. 
So if we look at typical clinical syndromes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, from a temporal dementia, vascular dementia, we find that while these clinical syndromes are real, they also tend to overlap and have some gray zones. So we see patients with Alzheimer's who also have some motor deficits, Parkinson's patients who also have some cognitive deficits, and even within Alzheimer's, some have more in the way of executive function problems or word choice problems, memory problems. And likewise, with regard to the other ones, for example, many of our patients at autopsy have vascular problems seen. So why this overlap? Why this fuzziness of diseases that are otherwise all too real? real? And the same is true when we look at sort of the litany of alphabet soups uh, from a temporal dementia, Lewis body dementia, posterior cerebral atrophy, the whole group of these things, we find the same thing. We find that while these are all too real, there are also atypical dementias, patients that don't quite fit into these categories and mixed dementias where patients fit into several. And I think it's become clearer and clearer in the neurology community globally that these are all some aspect of a, a unified disease. What we're looking at is patients who have very different clinical outcomes, but because they start at different places, they start with different genetic backgrounds, have genetic backgrounds, behavioral backgrounds, different histories. And the result when applied with a, some sort of a unified process, an age-related neurodegenerative process results in different clinical outcomes. But we need to understand that basic process. <clears throat> the same is true when we talk about a systems model. And this is a little more subtle, <clears throat> but let me give you an example. This is an Airbus 380 cockpit and a Rolls-Royce Pro 15 jet engine, and that's a Trent 900 turbofan with one of the fan blades. And this thing operates as a whole. That is, when the fan blade fails, the problem is not simply the fan blade, but how the fan blade fails in the context of that Trent 900 turbofan, in the context of powering that Rolls-Royce Rolls Pro 15 jet engine in action in an Airbus 380 at 35,000 feet, going hundreds of miles an hour at a high RPM and a high temperature. So it is a gestalt. We don't need to simply understand the components, the facts. We need to understand something more deeply about the system itself and how those components interact. The same is true in medicine. So for example, these are common signs and symptoms of COVID infection, but by themselves, they're not COVID. They are biomarkers, if you will, and it's important that we understand them, but we need to look more deeply and ask what's going on below them. And there we tend to know. It is a, an a interaction between a complex little COVID virus and the human immune system and many other organs. So to know simply the components, the biomarkers, the signs and symptoms is good, but it's not sufficient. The same is true when we look at aging itself. So these are common macroscopic biomarkers of aging I think we're all well aware of, but by themselves, these are not aging. Understanding these is good, but it's not sufficient if we want to understand the aging process itself. And even at the microscopic level, if we simply know, for example, that telomeres shorten or that there's a declining rate of ATP to reactive oxygen species, or that DNA repair goes down or methylation changes go down, <clears throat> methylation changes occur, that's not the same as understanding aging. That is good that we understand the facts, we have the data, but we need a deeper understanding of, as it were, the orbital mechanics, what's really going on at a fundamental level. <clears throat> the same is true when we look at the dementias. So these are common changes in age related dementias. For example, uh, failure of the blood-brain barrier, lymphatic changes, uh, alpha-synuclein act and glial cell activation. These are common things we see at pathology or, uh, with a number of, of imaging studies, but they're not the disease itself. They are biomarkers of the disease. The same is true when we look at this genetically. There have been more than 200 genes that have been linked to various age-related dementias, the classic being the ApoE4 allele in Alzheimer's, but also the pre genes and so on. But to understand the, the genes themselves that are linked is not to understand the activity of those genes, what they do and how they result in disease and why they do in some patients and not in others, even with the same genetic background. So let me ask a question that has come up repeatedly and I think it's critical to this discussion, which is what is the single greatest risk factor for h related disease? <clears throat> and to answer that question, let me turn to a friend of mine, Lynn Hayflick, Dr. Leonard Hayflick 60 years ago, describes cell aging for the first time in history. And he and I are still contact. He just won an award last week, actually. Um, but he gave me this quote, which I used in that paper I published last year. And he is correct. I think all of us would agree that the single major predictive risk factor for age-related disease is aging. But then most of us ignore aging and focus on narrower things like osteoarthritis or beta amyloid deposition without asking ourselves, what really is aging? So let's go a little further. If we want to be able to intervene in aging at the most fundamental level, we need to understand aging. And as I've said, for 50 years, I've realized that most people think they understand aging, but they're not actually asking themselves what's going on. 
So let me introduce you to some common species that you and I both know. Uh, humans in the upper right with a typical lifespan of about three quarters of a century currently. That is Coco, the gorilla who spoke sign language out of Stanford. I was her babysitter for a year. I will miss her. She died about a year or two ago. Her age at death was about 40. It's typical for a gorilla. Typical uh, domestic animals, depending on the breed, live about two decades, uh, a little less, about the same, but depending on the breed. Mice, other rodents, typically two or three years. Why? Well, we can't simply say that aging is wear and tear entropy without explaining that something more is going on. And most of us will agree that it's something to do with the genes. And that's probably true. For example, mice share about 75% of the protein expression genes with us as humans, leaving 25% that we don't plus regulatory genes. And I think we would all assume that the difference in lifespans has to do with those other genes that we don't quite share. Well, what? What is that difference exactly? How does it work? What is the fundamental mechanism? And that's true even when we look within a species like human beings, even when we look at the single gene, or in this case, the laminate gene. Uh, 20 years ago, I used to gather children from all over the world with progeria. In this particular year, Bill, Bill Sample in the background there, <coughs> and I took them for a tour of the White House. And we had a delightful time until two children in the front row, Sammy and Ori in the left in the front row, stepped on a, a pressure sensitive switch inside there that goes to the presidential quarters. And we were politely escorted out here to the north portico of the White House. Well, these children have early aging. This is Hutchinson, Guilford, Pajurix. Uh, they typical age at death is about 12.7 as a mean. They die overwhelmingly of age-related diseases, most commonly cardiovascular disease, strokes and heart attacks, for example. And yet they have osteoarthritis and other osteoporosis, skin aging, other aspects of aging. So why do they age so fast? Well, we know there's a linked gene, that is the laminate gene, but that does not explain why it works. What does the laminate gene do that results in these children having lifespans that are probably a fifth of what you and I have? Why does that occur? So saying it's genes is simply waving your hands. In fact, we know cases where the genes are the same and yet aging does not occur. So for example, every cell in your body derives from a fertilized ovum, the ovum came from your mother, and that line of ovum cells can be tracked back about 4.5 billion years of life on this planet. And that germ cell lineage showed no evidence of aging over time. It managed to maintain itself fairly well until you got it. And then most of your somatic cells demonstrate age-related changes. And you can't blame it on mitochondria because the same thing occurs. Every mitochondria in your body was inherited as a, as a brand new mitochondria, essentially a functional mitochondria, several decades ago, probably from your mother, you got it from her mother. And that line goes back about 1.7 billion years, depending on who's making the estimate. <clears throat> so you inherited functional mitochondria over that have been around for almost 2 billion years. And yet a matter of decades, your mitochondria right now, if I were to measure them, would show some age-related changes. But why is that? Again, we can't simply wave your hands. We have to get at this in more detail. And to look at aging a little more carefully, it's a matter of aging versus maintenance. So in the germ cell lineage, what you find is that maintenance is essentially flawless. It maintains itself in the face of entropy. Where if I look at the somatic cells in this 80-year-old man's hand in the wheelchair to the left, where I'm looking at fibroblasts, keratinocytes, macrophages, vascular endothelial cells, they all show subtle changes, uh, failures of maintenance in the face of entropy. So aging is not simply entropy. It's failed maintenance in the face of entropy. Sort of like the Red Queen, as, as the Red Queen said in Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll, we must run as fast as we can, simply stay in one place. And that's what our cells are doing. They maintain themselves by continually going into molecular turnover. If I look at any molecular pool in your body, whether it's collagen or elastin in my face or beta amyloid in my brain or uh, chondroitin in my, my joints, no matter where I look, myoglobin, uh, mitochondrial enzymes, they're continually being turned over. There's recycling is going on continually. And in young cells, what you find is that is sufficient to overcome and wash out the damage, molecular damage that normally occurs as part of entropic processes, uh, signified here with a little red star. But as our cells get older in the, in the Havelic sense, you find that the molecular turnover slows down. And this is true of both extracellular and intracellular molecules. In all the cells in your body, Slowly, you find these changes, and the result is a gradual accumulation of age-related cell damage. There's molecular damage that results in cell dysfunction. You can actually look at this mathematically. This is taken from a couple of my books, particularly my textbook. And what this basically says is that young cells have a rapid turnover per unit time for each molecular pool, with results having low accumulated damage at equilibrium, whereas older cells tend to have a slower turnover, and the result is that on the average, many of the molecules are dysfunctional. 
Now we could actually look at this again, for example, the brain. I can look at this in any, any organ system we'd like to. Again, my textbook goes through this in some detail. But if we're looking for the brain, for example, in Alzheimer's patients, we typically tend to focus on things like beta amyloid. So let's look at that one for a minute. What we find is that young cells in the brain, particularly microglial cells, they tend to make beta amyloid, secrete it, bind it, internalize it, degrade it, make it again, secrete it. There's a continual turnover, continual recycling of this. And the result is there's very little accumulated damage extracellularly. However, as we get older, that rate of turnover slows down and it's been measured. And the result is this gradual accumulation of beta amyloid microaggregates. Now, one of the questions I asked is, what is the role that genes play in all this? For example, if I have two APOE2 alleles, I tend to have a very low risk of Alzheimer's disease, even at advanced age. But the reason is that beta amyloid that I make with those two alleles tends to be very sticky. And the result is I make very little in the way of beta amyloid microaggregates. So I don't tend to get a high risk for Alzheimer's disease. However, if I'm unfortunate, and I've inherited two APOE4 alleles, I tend to make stickier beta amyloid molecules. So for an equivalent uh, degree of cell aging, I will have many more in the way of beta amyloid microaggregates. And a result of that is as we get older, those patients will tend to have beta amyloid plaques at a higher rate than will patients with two APOE2 alleles. And we can do the same thing, same analysis for any of the genes we've looked at. Likewise, we can look at other upstream issues like head trauma, exposure to toxins, microbial infections, and we'll see the same sort of impact on cell dysfunction with age. And the result of all this is basically clinical dementias, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and others. And the same is true whether we're looking at beta amyloid, tau proteins, alpha synuclein mitochondrial changes, inflammatory changes, and so forth. So to take an example, let's look at mitochondrial dysfunction with age. About 99% of all the aerobic enzymes in your mitochondria derive from the nucleus. And as telomere shorten, we find that the rate of turnover goes down. And a result of that is a slower turnover of the molecular, uh, the enzymes in the mitochondria. So then you get more and more dysfunctional aerobic enzymes. And as a result, that ATP to ROS ratio uh, tends to go down. We get more in the way of reactive oxygen species, less in the way of actual power molecules, the adenosine triphosphate. But the same is true with regard to the membranes. The lipid membranes are also being turned over more slowly. So you get increasing porosity and you get more and more of these reactive oxygen species leaking out. You make more, you leak more. And the scavenger molecules, the superoxide dismutases and catalases uh, tend to be turned over more slowly. So again, they're not doing the job as well. And when there is damage, the molecules that are damaged are also being recycled less quickly. So for at least four independent reasons, you find increasing molecular dysfunction as a result of changes with mitochondrial function with age. The same is true, by the way, of molecules that you repair as opposed to simply recycle the DNA. Four families of DNA repair enzymes, and those four families independently show slight subtle changes, slowing down of the rate of recycling. And the result is these molecular families become more and more dysfunctional. And so you get an exponential increase in mutation against cancer over lifespan, not over years, by the way, but over lifespan of the species. So in a mouse that's over two years, and you and I, it's over 80 years, but it's the same exponential increase in cancer. So overall, what we're seeing is this process. We have upstream factors that have an impact on cell function and specifically on cell aging and downstream outcomes as a result of changes in cell function and cell aging. And in a general way, what's going on in cell aging is that as the cells divide, telomeres shorten, and those actually have an impact on the pattern of epigenetic expression. Gene expression changes subtly and throughout the cell as a result of changes in telomere length. And the result of that is slower molecular turnover, result of that is dysfunctional cells, dysfunctional organs, and what we see clinically as age-related disease and aging itself. So the question comes up, can we intervene? Well, for a long time, medically, we've been intervening upstream, for example, uh, trying to prevent trauma, trying to lower your exposure to, to toxins, trying to control infections, trying to control your blood pressure and make sure you're euglycemic. Um, those all are manifest uh, uh, targets that we've had in clinical medicine. And they have some benefits, but they have not stopped aging nor stopped age-related diseases. Downstream, likewise, we focus more recently on things like beta amyloid plaque, for example, monoclonal antibody studies that I alluded to earlier. But even when we intervene downstream, for example, with reactive oxygen species scavengers, we found that the outcome is disappointing. The question is, can we do something that's optimal for intervention? The answer is actually yes, and it's been done. This is a paper from Science Magazine some 23 years ago patient by Andrea Bodnar and her group out at Jaron, in Jaron, California, Menlo Park. And what they did was show that you can take 
A young cell and has a specific pattern, for example, human fibroblast of gene expression, and an old human fibroblast has a different pattern. And when you use telomerase to relink the telomeres, you reset the entire pattern of gene expression to that of a younger cell. So we have known for 23 years that we can reverse aging in human cells in the laboratory, in my tissues. That was first done by Walter Funk and his group now 21 years ago. Uh, and Walter and the group also were out at Sharon in California. And what they showed is that if you take young human skin cells and you grow them, for example, in a mouse, you can get what looks like young human skin. You do this with old human skin cells, you get what looks like old human skin. If you take those same old human skin cells and relenting telomeres, you can grow young human skin on that same mouse. So we know we can reset tissue aging. We also know that we can do this in osteocytes. We know that we can do this in, in vascular endothelial cells. And the question is, can we do this in organisms? First time that was effectively shown was a little more than 10 years ago, about 11 years ago or so, by a group at Harvard, Ron DePino's group. And he used a technique that doesn't help us clinically because he altered the germ cell lineage and bred a specific uh, group of, of mice to do what he wanted. But here's a paper from De Jesus et al. It's Maria Blasco's group in Madrid at CNIO, one of the world's uh, leading cancer institutes. And what she showed is that you can use telomerase and a mouse turt um, to reset not only behavior, but also physiologic improvements as well as increasing lifespan in these organisms. Now, the technique is not as good as we'd like it to be, but the outcome is dramatic. And by the way, we also see in these sort of studies that you can actually regrow brain tissue as well as have improvements of neural stem cells, proliferation, proliferation, proliferation uh, differentiation, and so on. Now, as a result of that, we're gonna take this to human trials and see if we can actually show that we can reverse aging in human patients and cure and prevent age-related diseases. Our focus will be obviously on efficacy, and we'll be able to do this well, and do, do it safely, which we think we can, but also do it credibly. The entire field of longevity, aging, particularly Alzheimer's disease, is uh, rife with claims that are difficult to substantiate. So we're going to be careful where we do this and how we do this. But the concern about credibility has allowed us to attract a remarkable group of global experts who are well-known and have good reputations. Uh, for example, uh, Suzanne Hendricks helped to design some of those biogene ESI studies in Anakinemab. Kurt Whittemore was a postdoc in the Maria Velasco group and did that work on mice. Joe Araujo does most of the large animal group uh, work with dogs and Alzheimer's. Mamuna Zeus runs a, a neural, uh, neurologic uh, gene therapy institute back in the UK. The same is true of our clinical advisory board. We chose them not only for their reputations for probity, credibility, but for skepticism. And what we found was that they found this model intriguing enough to want us to test it and want to make sure that we test it rigorously, which we intend to do. We'll be using telomerase therapy. Our initial target will be Alzheimer's in the brain, but secondarily, we'll be going after vascular disease. And in fact, this is a platform therapy. We can use this for any, almost any organ system or almost any age-related diseases. So it'll be a single dose using the customized cassette in our human patients. And we'll try to answer this question. The first is, can we alter aging at the most fundamental level? And the answer, as I say, is yes. There's data that's showing that we can do this for the past 23 years. But the question is, can we use it to cure and prevent real age-related disease in human beings? The answer is, we'll see what the data shows. As I've always stressed to all of my students, graduate students, residents, and otherwise, theory is excellent. And it's a good logical sound theory, but data wins every time. So this is still the general question. And what are the prospects for intervention? I think they're remarkably good. I think we're about to do something historically that's never been done before which is to show that we can not only intervene effectively in aging, but cure and prevent age-related human diseases. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that if you're curious, you'll get in touch with me. I look forward to hearing from you and good luck.